Good morning. I'm delighted to be with you at the opening of your conference, even though um, I'm distantly absent. And I, I, would, I would like to say how much it means to me to have been invited to be a participant in this and how sad I am not to actually be with you in, in body. But um, unfortunately, I uh, had pancreatic cancer four years ago, which was operated on and thoughtfully cured. And then um, getting on for a year ago, they found I got secondaries and told me that I might only have three to six months to live. Uh, which has proved to be a little bit of a pessimistic assessment, as you can see. But um, approaching dying, know, knowing that there was no treatment, no cure for this, has been quite a, quite a remarkable experience for me. I, I turned my back on any chemo because the chance of that doing anything useful was nil. My, my daughter, who works in the upper echelons of the National Health Service consulted with a premier expert in the country on that and he said, Sarah, if your dad was suffering from the same as, if my dad was suffering from the same as your father, I would tell him to do exactly the same as your father. And so um, that gave me a reassurance. But then I, in our church network and locally in the town, but through the prime network, so many people all over the world started praying for me. People are never met maybe and continuing and it has been a remarkable experience because I have actually had one of the best years of my life I have felt so positive so loved so endorsed and I would say I just hope anybody who's dying could have that same reassurance that same feeling of being loved and cared for and, and that is something which the spiritual care department cannot just give of itself but can actually put that attitude into the whole hospital and um, the, the way that we can change morale in hospital has been quite marked in, in the work we're doing, an ongoing work of inputting uh, message compassion without burnout into our local hospitals in this southeast corner of England. And um, certainly my local hospital, which I have to visit as a patient as well as a, a teacher and a member of their wellbeing team, the morale has risen noticeably that staff look happier. In fact, one um, head of nursing uh, said to me, uh, you know, since, since those seminars, she said, I have actually made a point of every time I pass a nurse in the corridor, whether she's in my team or not, she said, I say, good morning, are things okay? And she said, and you should say, yes, <laughs> but occasionally they don't. And, and she said, but now, she said, nurses have started smiling at each other and saying, how are things? And um, I've noticed as a patient, even the patients waiting in the waiting rooms are now talking with each other. There's, there's um, uh, speech, even jokes. And it's very different from it was maybe even three years ago. And that's remarkable. So, okay, well, who am I? I'm Dr. John Gita, uh, qualified. 51 years ago, a long time, and um, I started my career in the Himalayas. Uh, th this, this I put up as, as a keynote because that was one of the good days. Here I was between, anywhere on that day, between uh, 12 and 15,000 feet on a fairly level path by Himalayan standards. Uh, enjoying the, the smell of the pine trees. That was good. The day before we had had about 3,000 metres of climb through leech infested jungle and that was far from fine. And I think one of the lessons for spiritual care is that we have to be proactive in equipping people to cope with the difficulties and at the same time be curative when they're in trouble. But I learned on these long treks through the Himalayas to do village clinics and, and detect leprosy in distant places that the good days made the bad days bearable. And that ability to bank the good against the bad and the bad against the good enables you to actually grow stronger and stronger. As I said, one of my tasks was to build a hospital 
I didn't expect to have to design this as well, but I found myself having to draw the plans on the kitchen table, which did eventually emerge into one of the uh, hospitals of East Bhutan, one of the premier hospitals, which stood for, for many years until replaced by a huge new structure. But um, one of the great things I learned from that was that with help, one can do all sorts of things that you feel beyond your abilities. And the lovely thing about designing a hospital and then seeing it constructed is that you see it, you feel participant in something that is going to be useful. You, you design, that you have a, a, a meaning in life. And, and this is something which is so necessary to, to, to be able to say, the world is better for my having been here. And in some small way, I hope that is true. I hope it's true for all of you at this conference. Another of my jobs was to uh, look after two and a half thousand Tibetan refugees. And these were people who'd come from, obviously from Tibet into Bhutan, and they'd fled from the Chinese, and some of them had the most appalling stories. Uh, there was one man who fractured his ankle, and he walked, despite the pain, down a rough track for about four kilometres to get to, to the hospital. And he was there, and he'd got a big laceration as well, so I went to give him some local anaesthetic to suit the laceration and he started screaming. And I, I said to the Tibetans who were there, I said, what, what's the matter with him? What's the matter? And um, they, they said, and then they translated to me, he'd been captured by the Chinese and they tortured him for months, sticking needles in him every day. And so, unless you know the patient's background, the things that have moulded them, the things that affect them, you cannot really treat them. And that again is spiritual care. It's, it's fine, the, the medical staff can detect that there's something wrong. Sometimes they get a bit more, but then that needs healing, that needs compassionate talking through, compassionate rehabilitation. The problem is that our medical training equips us for learning things which we need to pass exams. And this is one of the problems. People go into medicine or nursing uh, or other medical branches with the aspiration of doing good, to heal people, to make them better. But then in the, in the, in the course, and in order to pass exams, we have to learn the course of the internal jugular vein or the trigeminal nerve. And because we have to pass an exam in those, they become the important things to learn. And we then quite often forget how to read the emotions that the face portrays. And that reading the eyes, look into the eyes of the patient, it's so important. And that's one of the features that we've, I find quite distressing in modern society, that people pass each other without looking. If I go for a walk in the country, usually if you're passing somebody, they stop, or, or just as we go past, we say, nice day, or something like that. At least there's a contact. But walking in our cities, our crowded cities, we pass each other and everyone's separate. Everyone's wrapped up in their own little world. There's no recognition of a common humanity. I, I, I read a poem which said, Whenever I walk in a London street, I pass many people, but our eyes don't meet. We'll never share our stories though the pavement shares our feet. And so many of us go through, and, and that applies to hospital corridors, that we can pass other members of staff, patients, and not acknowledge their existence. Where it's just a, a smile or a hello, particularly to other members of staff, even if we don't know them, but acknowledging them. It can make a big difference. When, when I was teaching uh, in a local hospital, a grand round on compassion without burnout and I asked the question is it right to smile at a patient and, and, and there was confusion I think they thought it was one of those questions that there's no good answer to that if they say yes I'll find some reason no and if, I, if they say no I'll find some reason to say yes but eventually one uh, young first-year doctor 
uh, did say, I think it might be. And I said, yes, yes, there are circumstances when it's not, but on the whole, yes. What happens if somebody smiles at you? And she said, well, I smile back. And how do you feel? I feel better. Okay, so you smile as a patient, they smile back at you. You feel good, they feel good, and you've developed a relationship. Because that's how we're built as human beings. And we must never lose that. Because that's the essence of our job. Anyway, from Bhutan, I came by New Zealand, which was a great experience, to Hastings, where I practiced from an um, old building, which had been a surgery for... Uh, 150 years. Actually, we call it surgery in Britain. It would be office or clinic in most languages. And there I, I learned a lot about people. I learned the importance of long-time relationships with people and, and being there for people. And gradually they started coming and unraveling the, the cause of, of the malaise within them. And this was resulting in illness and symptoms. And I learned a lesson from one of my colleagues, John Carrow. He said the two important times in a consultation are to look how the patient enters the room and how they leave it. Do they come in full of confidence and it's obviously something that they deem trivial? Or do they come in a bit hesitantly, how much can I say, how much can I say? And when they leave, do they hesitate? Do they hesitate that fraction of a second and you say they haven't told me the full story? And you can say, is that all? Do you need some more? But um, so often, a patient comes in the room and the doctor is writing the notes up from the last patient, or uh, when they leave, it's already writing up their notes, which is good, it's good to write notes. But the patient must feel that they are important, that they're cared for by the doctor, cared for by the nurse. And whilst there I started teaching as a teaching general practitioners, family doctors, and we started to realise that there was um, a big gulf in their, their training that they, that when we were teaching these qualified doctors, but the teaching lacked, um, lacked understanding of the whole person dimension. And the, some of the courses we were running were just stuff that drug companies could dish out, just facts, 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 without the person being addressed. And so we started running courses for, um, for qualified family doctors, not just those in training, uh, approved by the Royal College of GPs, that would bring the human dimension of the patient in, ask the ethical questions, the, the existential questions that are needed. And then we started doing these from a, a charity point of view. We, we, we decided that those of us teaching it um, would work for nothing, uh, but use the money to bring over doctors from Eastern Europe who had little access at that time to postgraduate education. And um, we did that. And then we started thinking, well, if we actually take the teaching and the course overseas, we can reach even more. And so um, what has now become Prime started. And we, we started in Romania and then Albania and then we got incorporated with UNICEF and British Council of USAID to help with programs in different places, Tunisia and Eastern Europe. And um, we realised this is something which may be of use to people everywhere. And um, one of the groups we, we love teaching were, were young doctors. And, and here I am with a group of young doctors here in Prague uh, some years ago. And um, I put this up specially because um, there on my right-hand side, left of the picture, is um, Dr. Eva Kalbinska, the lovely lady who worked so passionately to establish the unit in Prague in Motor Hospital 
and who tragically died in the road accident. She, I, I have greatest um, respect and, and love for this lady because she, she just lived for what she believed. And I think that legacy is part of what you've inherited in the spiritual care unit. So we also started seeing that there was a gulf, a gulf between what people get in their medical education, the way that people practice healthcare, and the teaching in the background of culture, and particularly religious leaders, that the health always used to be a part of religious practice, and I'll come to that shortly. But today it's been divided that church and healthcare is, is separate, religion and health are separate. And that doesn't do a service to people because people are not divided people. In fact, here in um, Nepal, for example, we've, we've been teaching uh, doctors, qualified psychiatrists, uh, most of the time there. But then a church group asked us, could we do something on rural health for their rural church leaders? And here there was a group of 93 of them who were brought together for a conference. And so they did a, a sort of spiritual aspect of the conference for three days. Then they had three days with us using Nepali uh, Christian NGOs as well as we tutors. And um, the sum total of that, we got some feedback from people saying we've been able to help so many more people in our villages just by having a basic understanding of the dynamic between health, illness and, and personal beliefs, personal behaviour. And so we, we're just trying to bring these two, two things together. Because when you bring the two together, you get this. This is a doctor, uh, Dr. Mary, from the, at that time the Emmanuel Hospital in Herbertpur in India. And here she is consulting, and you see the gaze between the eyes, and it's a dark room. But the reason is that this is not a leisurely consultation. This is a time of the Pakistan earthquake when Emmanuel Hospital sent a, a team up to, to help with the many victims. And here is this, this lady. She is a Christian. The patient is a Muslim. She is educated. The patient is probably a very, barely educated. She is an Indian. The lady is a Pakistani. Those two nations are still at war officially. And yet in that love, that compassion, that concern, those two people are bonded together. You see the hand stretch out, not touching some cultures it's right to touch, some cultures it's not, but just stretched out saying I care. And the two are together as one. And really that relationship in this time of trauma that this woman has been through, maybe seeing members of her family die, that reassurance, that compassion, that actual bondage between human, two human beings is as healing as any medicine that she can give. And I just love the look of amazement on the child's face. But why then do we get this? This is a picture painted by the American artist uh, Robert Pope, who spent the last two months of his life in a, a very good cancer hospital in the States. And this is how he depicted the ward round. I'd like you just to look at this bit and think what is the dynamic behind here. If I were with you, I'd ask you the question, what do you see? And above all, what do you feel? What do you feel? And why do you feel it? Because to me, as a, a person suffering from cancer, I, I want someone who actually cares for me, not views me as an object, as a specimen. And yet this is there, is looking down, looking down from above. How does that put the relationship? In a hospital in Nepal, with which we're linked, the, uh, the hospital has just purchased a stool, a stool, a low chair, beside every patient's bed, so that the person talking to them, the doctor, the physiotherapist, the nurse, the, whoever it is, they actually sit and they talk to them at eye level. 
and they've said the patients are saying, oh, it is so much better. And eye-to-eye -eye contact, that is human. And so why has this happened? We, we deal with this in more depth in a, a talk on YouTube called The Incredibly Brief History of Medicine. So I'm not going to go into that. If you want to go to YouTube, you can look at it. But we had, in the time of the Enlightenment, the Great Divide, because up till that time, the church, churches, and in fact, um, for a long time, the, the, the Muslim uh, faith groups had provided health care. And somehow it might have been not the same scientific standard as we have, but it's, um, it, was, it was caring and it, it did help people and um, what have you, but they didn't divide the personal, the inner, the spiritual from the physical and the environmental. And yet at the Enlightenment, the church had started to want to hold on to this and, and put dogma in place. The, medical profession was wanting to break free from that and take science away from humanity. Up to that time, if you qualified as a doctor, you had to qualify in humanities and science. But with the Enlightenment, they became divided. And with that came a separation. That what we want to see is coming back, the humanity of medicine and the science of medicine to be brought back together. That religion has a role to play. It may have a bad role, but it could have a good role. And what we want to see is, is, is the acknowledgement of that because Jesus in his whole ministry, his whole teaching, the healing of the sick and the spiritual message, they were coupled absolutely. And we see when these come together, this picture by a very famous artist, probably not the style that you would expect, but Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso, um, in his very early days, painted this, and it's called Science and Compassion, Ciencia y Caritas. Uh, and what one sees here is, of course, the doctor providing the science, but at the same time ensuring that the nurse was there, probably a religious order nun, religious order there, bringing sustenance, reassurance, and, and, and showing also that her child is being looked after. That reassurance is so important. Let me give a, an illustration, a somewhat facile one, uh, perhaps, but I, I hope it makes a point, at least with some, some people. Um, we, we are given two hands. Some people lose one or both tragically, but on the whole, we function with two hands, a right hand and a left hand, and they do different things with different degrees of skill. And the important thing is that we do them in unison. If we're doing some intricate task, the right and the left need to reinforce each other, to be in tune with each other. And so, let's illustrate that. We have here two hands, which are not anatomically correct, but um, nevertheless, uh, they have to function. Two hands, um, one representing the objective side of our nature, the scientific side, the, the side that reasons and questions, uh, knows all the pharmacopoeias, knows the procedures, knows the intricacies of surgery. The other side is actually who we are, our existential side, our relational side, the human side of us. And so often we go through life, we, somebody described it as uh, we, we wear our normal clothes when we're at home and then they come off when we get to the hospital and we put on a, a white coat or hospital drapes. And we change personality, we switch from one side of our person to the other. So what we need to do is find a way to actually weld these two parts of us together just like we interlock our two hands. And if we do them in the right way, the right intricacy, we end up with one heart, the true heart of healthcare, which is subjective and objective, it's relational and scientific. And that's what we must aim for in ourselves, whether we're in the spiritual side or the uh, medical side, 
we need to have that same relationship to different skills. Some people are right-handed, some are left-handed. We need each other. We need each other with different skills, different expertise. But uh, on the whole, we need to function with the heart of healthcare as our heart and at the heart of how we behave as individuals in the hospital and as the hospital itself, the heart of healthcare. And we see it here in another picture by Robert Pope from the Cancer Hospital. This is some man who's just been told he's dying, but he is, is feeling safe. The two attendants, doctor, nurse, just ward attendant, we don't know. But they might be a different religion. But this man, obviously, that cross on his neck is important to him for his inner stability. And their whole being, his concentration on them is saying, we care for you, we care for you, and we're here for you, and we'll be here for you throughout. And so what we want to see is not just the two talking to each other, establishing relations, we want to see them absolutely bound together, not with dogmatic religion, but with the essence of spiritual care, the love, the compassion, the um, thing the Bible describes as the fruit of the Spirit, coupled with the rigorous science that is clinical medicine. Put the two together and we have something wonderful. And one of the lessons I learned in my life is from this place, the Hospitale Santa Maria della Scala in Siena. And it's a very unimposing looking building from the outside, unlike the big grand cathedral opposite. But it's where from the 11th century that monks and nuns cared for the sick. They, they had a, a rule of caring for beggars, pilgrims and orphans. And they were endowed with some money from the church and they cared. And it grew a growing reputation that here we see a man who's come in, presumably a beggar, stripped of his clothes with a massive wound. And we see the, the care that he's receiving. And here he's, um, he's being cared for. Now I often ask the question, is this good care or bad care? And quite often, that was kind of bad, he should be attending to the wound, not washing his feet. But if you look at the expression on the man's face, there's terror, there's, there's traumatic stress. And this man is comforting him. He is especially in washing the feet, that is to take the action that Jesus did with his disciples. But the whole thing is providing reassurance and comfort. And the surgeon is there waiting to go there, but he's waiting and saying, dealing with the man's spiritual need is more important than mine because hemostasis is already achieved. Dealing with the spiritual need is so important. And that's something with all trauma cases, that it grieves me when I see trauma cases dealt with so clinically when their inner being has been traumatised. And that inner trauma can cause lifelong debility. And the two need to be attended to together. And here we see another component of that same unit. We see one of the friars attending to the spiritual needs of a patient who may be dying or whatever, he's providing that. The unit provides them at the same time, together. And further than that, it goes on. Because here we see the man restored, and they, they didn't say, oh, well, you're better. So if so many patients say to me, oh, the surgeon really seemed to care about me all the time up to my operation. But when it was done, I didn't see him. And there's that feeling <coughs> that the care was a put on, a pretense. And I think that's sad because just acknowledging the patient's done well so often good. And that, that often does happen as well. And certainly the care that I've received has on the whole been very much like that. Maybe part of it because I'm a doctor, but it's, it's that feeling that I've mattered to somebody so he will have done his best for me or she will have done their best for me. But here, the, the, the person is restored, but they, they want to restore him as a person as well. So they provide every patient who goes out with clean, 
new clothes, not second-hand cast off. This man was probably a beggar, being given new clothes, and restore his dignity as well as his body, so that his spirit, his essence, who he is, is being restored. Then we <clears throat> we we need to to practice in this light that we are there to give meaning to patients' lives, but meaning to our own lives. What, one of the things in the pictures that we saw was the, the sheer community that was existing in that, that place. Even the, the rector took part in the care. The rector was, interestingly, there was a picture of his installation, and he, he had started as quite a high-ranking priest with gorgeous robes and and when he became the rector of the hospital he put off the gorgeous robes and put on the brown cloak of humility I'm here to serve and and to me that's what the church should be about it should be about serving humanity in love and care and compassion and that hospital if ever you're in Siena do go and see it it's, it's quite remarkable I am um, I reached a crisis point in my career at one stage, and I just want to share this with you. Um, I'd had a, an episode with a patient, and I chose the wrong drug. It wasn't a wrong drug, in fact it was actually the right drug at the time, but it was a drug that actually ended up the patient had a very abnormal reaction. In fact, it was only the second time it had been recorded. Uh, but they should become known that this was going to become a common reaction. But I felt responsible and everyone said, you're not to blame, doctor. You're not to blame. Even the patient said you're not to blame. And yet I blamed myself because I'd failed a patient that I cared for, that I wanted to help. And I find myself thinking deep depression, anxiety, and I went as a trainer, we had a, a regular trainer's refresher workshop three times a year, and one time I had to arrange that for the, uh, the other trainers in the county, um, but this was one I went to, uh, organised by one of my colleagues, and he said to us as we sat down, he said, Draw a picture of how you see yourself at the moment. And this is pretty well the picture I drew, not exactly. But I picture myself on a rocking raft in a, in a tempestuous sea with a shark waiting to devour me if I fell off and burdened down with all sorts of pressures, with money worries even, and, and things like that. And that's how I saw myself, my life lived like that waiting for another disaster and I thought gosh that's difficult why have I got like this why am I like this and I'd set off when I came back from Bhutan I'd entered general practice it was a new life and I started juggling balls I, I had uh, my uh, my family obviously my family was growing I had another child and uh, I had my my work which was growing. I grew a much bigger practice. I, I had um, church. I, I enjoyed being responsibility in the church and, and having that, but again it's another burden and people from church came and consulted me. I had friends, which is great, but again they require time. But I was kept going on this by idealism, I realised. I, I, I was doing my work because it had meaning. It was, it was something I had been called to. But somewhere along the line, I had dropped the idealism. I was doing it because it was routine, I had to, I had to earn me money, I cared, my family fed, and that's why I was doing it. And then when disaster struck, I got no reserve. And as I looked at it, I thought, what can I do, what can I do? And I had a picture of a rock. If that raft could come stabilised on a rock, I would be safe, I wouldn't fall off, the shark wouldn't get me, and I could build my life again. And I thought, what would that rock be? What would that rock be? And I thought, actually, 
I've lost sight of who I am. I've lost sight of why I'm here. I've lost sight of what I'm meant to be doing. And I've lost sight really of where I'm going, where's my ultimate destiny. Then I thought, actually, this is what we all need. We all need this firm rock to know who we are, who we are, why are we here. It, they're, they're fundamental questions. And so many people start asking them and find, oh, I don't know an answer. And today's generation particularly is so unstable. I believe that's why there's so many suicides now, increasing an epidemic of suicide. And um, who am I? I? I thought, well, fundamentally, this is me. I'm not giving this answer for anybody else. Who am I? I am a child of God. Why am I here? Well, to love him and serve him and in some way to leave the world slightly better for my being here. So what have I got to do? Well, that as he leads. Where am I going? Well, I don't mind. I don't care. Because if those first three are right, then the ultimate destiny is going to be okay. So I would say that the greatest benefit that spiritual care can give is to help people not lose their identity by providing ongoing care within the hospital staff for those who work here, to keep them alive to who they are in relationship with one another, but also to re-establish identity for those for whom it's lost before and they happen to be ill, or for whom that loss of identity has actually caused their illness. So I wish I was with you for this conference. I would love to be there. But I can't be, but I send you my best wishes and greetings. And that Prime will help in any way we can. It's meaningful to you. I'm so glad that Dr. Alison Gray is there. And um, she will be a great blessing.